So now we are in module nine, lecture three, hashes in blockchain. We already saw the main uh, features of the hash function. And in this lecture, what we're going to see is one of the main applications of the hash function in uh, the blockchain networks. And uh, in particular, we're going to see three applications. We are going to see commitments. Uh, we are going to see Merkle trees and we are going to see uh, how to use the hash function to build a consensus algorithm of, uh, of a blockchain system. So let's start with the first application. Uh, but before, yeah, we should say here, uh, which is the, the knowledge that we uh, require here is primitives about, uh, well, the, the most uh, primitive uh, use about blockchain, authentication, integrity, well, so some things that we already saw in, in this uh, model. And then after this lesson, you will be able to apply mainly the blockchain function to different aspects of, uh, the, blockchain, of the blockchain system. Um, so without more to say, let's see uh, the learning objectives, as I said is to learn uh, different uh, different applications, uh, commit commitments in first place, uh, in, in particular the two sub-processes that build the commitments, which are the commit and reveal. Then we will see uh, how Merkle trees work. And uh, finally, we will see the uh, one application to the core of the blockchain system, which is the consensus algorithm. So yeah, now let's go to the uh, commitments. And uh, yeah, well, first uh, let's define what, what is a commitment. And uh, a commitment is a cryptographic primitive, so it's something uh, from cryptography that allows uh, someone to commit uh, to a chosen value or a statement. I mean, you, you commit to something. And then uh, while you commit to this, this uh, this this uh, statement or value or whatever will be hidden from others. And uh, at some point later in time, I will have the, uh, the ability to reveal the content, in this case, of uh, the commitment. Uh, the analogy of uh, this uh, is a, it's a silly envelope. Okay, this is the, anal the analogy in the real world. It is an envelope in which inside this envelope you put whatever you want and then you seal the envelope, you close the envelope, nobody can open this envelope, no nobody can see anything here. And uh, at a certain point in time, then I open the envelope and, and show what is inside. Okay, so this is, this is the idea of a commit and reveal. Uh, and uh, well, the first uh, the first phase of this primitive is just the commit. Just you put inside whatever you want, okay. And then after some time, then you uh, here you commit, okay. And then after some time, you can reveal what is inside. Okay. So these are the two phases. Um, the commit is when you choose what you want and the reveal is when you just uh, open the, the ceiling, the, the, the envelope and, and everybody can see what's inside. Um, well, these two processes need to fulfill some properties uh, in order to be a cryptographic commit and reveal scheme. Okay, And uh, the properties are first uh, the the commit scheme must be hiding. It means that uh, nobody can see what's inside the envelope in, in, in our analogy. Okay, so I put inside something in this envelope, but until I decide to open the envelope, nobody can see anything here inside. Okay, so uh, so in in a put it in a definition is that. Uh, a party cannot obtain the committed value unless it has been revealed. Okay, so while the commitment is not open, then the content is 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 hide for everybody. And uh, the other 
property that we need to fulfill is binding. Uh, once I decide to commit to some value or a statement, then I cannot change this value or a statement. Okay, so this is the idea. So the the value or, or the statement that I've I've committed to cannot be changed. Okay, so I cannot go, I cannot uh, go and open the envelope and change the content. This is not possible. Okay, so let's let's see an application of this uh, of this scheme and uh, to to see how it works. And then we will see how to build it with a hash function. So an application could be tossing coins, playing uh, toss, uh, playing the game of tossing coins. Okay, so suppose that uh, Alice and Bob, uh, they are in the same place. I mean, they are physically in the same place and they want to, you know, to do a coin. They want to toss a coin and then someone says, uh, I don't know, hits or tails. And then, yeah, they, they are playing uh, Toss, to, they are playing tossing coins. The uh, well, if they are physically on the same place, then the procedure is is the typical way of playing this is is really you know easy. Is uh, Alice selects hits or tails, and then the other one, Bob, typically flips the coin, and then we see what's the result, and then Alice basically and alice and bob both see which is the result and then well the the the, the winner is decided uh without any problem okay well now let's let's try to move this scenario to uh, a remote scenario okay and then uh if we try to play this game in a remote scenario i mean alice and bob are not in the same place uh, a remote scenario is, in, is, is one in which Alice and Bob, as I said, are not in the same place, then, then we have a problem because, uh, well, we have a problem here of uh, that, uh, you know, if Alice selects, I mean, if we start with Alice selecting heads or tails, then Bob, then Bob Cap can, can say whatever when uh, he flips the the, the coin okay because alice is not going to see anything so uh essentially bob can stipulate whatever uh he wants so that uh, he wins okay so maybe you can think okay let, let's try to flip the coin first but uh if bob f flips the coin first and say okay i flip the coin and the result is is heads then alice will say okay i selected heads so it's the other way around then. Alice will always win here, okay? So they, they, they would like to play, uh, here we have Alice and Bob. Uh, and they would like to play causing toys, but they are remote, they, they, you, could, you could think that they, for example, they are in a, in a telephone, in a telephonic conversation, okay? And, and the problem is that uh, we cannot do the, Two actions at the same time. Uh, I mean, uh, one needs to happen before the other one, and, and, and we need to need to know the result or, or communicate the result. Okay, so I mean, it is almost impossible to you know coins to to say the result of the tossing the coin and, and what I selected at the same time. Okay, so th there is always one that is going to be first, and then you have the opportunity of, of winning. So uh, this is this is a problem that can be solved by uh, by using a commitment uh, a commitment scheme, okay? Because in this case, if we use a commitment scheme, then uh, Alice and Bob can use commitment to to solve this because uh, here first Alice selects he heads or tails. Uh, but only tells a commitment, well, this is something, this is a cryptographic primitive. We, we have a, a string of bits, essentially, is going to be the commitment. Okay, so, uh, but, you know, in, in our analogy, in our analogy, we, we are going to create a sealed envelope inside 
uh, we will put our choice, in this case hits, for example, and then yeah, we have a, and then you cannot change whatever you put inside, and and, and Bob cannot see anything here. Uh, the as you, as we will see in a, just in, in a moment, this commitment is going to be represented by a string of bits. Okay, it's going to be just a, a string of zeros and ones. Okay, and I can send this string to Bob. Okay, and this is my commitment, and uh, this commitment will not allow Alice to change. The decision and then Bob flips the coin and reports the result okay and say okay Alice uh, I flip the coin and the result is whatever he heads or tails and then finally uh, Alice reveals the uh, decision he she was committed to so uh, and Bob simply needs to verify that uh, that Alice, Alice choice is the one that was uh, that, that was in the commitment. Okay. So um, if and obviously, well, if if uh, if the result of the tossing the coin was hits and, and I committed to hits, I, I win. Alice wins. If not, uh, Alice loses. Okay. So mm, this is one. Way of using uh, well, this is a simple, sim very simple uh, scenario in which we can use commitments, okay? But uh, they are really useful in blockchain, and mainly uh, they uh, they can be used in smart contracts to simulate like simultaneous moves or uh, or or just to simulate that. Uh, I mean, I commit to something and and I don't reveal it after some time, okay? Uh, for example, this can be this this uh, can be used in uh, scenarios like uh, in, in which there is a uh, in which there is an, an auction, and, and then you can you can beat. To this auction, and do you want? And do you do you don't want to reveal which is your bid until you know the bidding pro the bidding time finishes, for example? Okay, so yeah, these schemes are very, really important uh, to build uh, many applications on, on, on blockchain. So now, and, and you will have some examples uh, during your practices. So now, now let's see how to build, how technically we can build this uh, scheme and uh, well before going to this just discuss a little bit the security i mean why this this is uh, this way of playing uh, of playing tossing coins is is uh, secure well uh, bob uh, i mean the commitment is, is secure because for for bob uh, if Bob wants to be able to change the result in, in his favor, he, he must be able to to see which inside the commitment. But, you know, we have the, the hidden property of commitments that doesn't allow Bob to see what's inside the commitment. So Bob, Bob cannot break the security uh, of this. And similarly, Alice cannot change the result after she knows which is the... Uh, which is the result of, of of tossing the coin? So Alice cannot change. If if Alice Alice said uh, heads, he may she may, may she must stay with heads. He cannot change it. So and, and this is the uh, yeah this is the property of binding. Okay. So by the properties of binding and hiding, uh, then play, playing coins uh, tossing coin remote, remotely with commitments. Uh, this is a secure. Uh, this is a, a secure way of doing it. Um, okay, so now le le now let's see an implementation of a commitment scheme, and uh, the implementation is simply uh, can be uh, as simple as uh, using a hash function. Okay, so in this case, 
the commitment is just the hash of the data. I mean, I commit to some data, and the easiest way to implement a commitment is just hash this data. And the uh, hash of this data is, the, is just the thing that we use as commitment. Okay, and this is this is okay because uh, the hash of data, in fact, you know, doesn't doesn't reveal any information about the data. I mean, uh, remember that uh, the hash function behaves like assigning a random a random string to an input. So this the hash of something has nothing to do with this something. So yeah, it's it's hiding. So it is hiding. And uh, also, it is not easy to change. I mean, you cannot change. Uh, you cannot change the input in any in any way without affecting the output. I mean, it, uh, if you change the input, then the hash will give another different, another total dif totally different value. Even if you change a bit, you know, in the input of a hash function, the output will be uh, randomly. I mean, it will be another random number. So yeah, uh, the hash function is uh, is fulfilling our two properties: is is hiding and binding. Okay. Well, we only have a small problem: is uh, that uh, if we go back to our example, then we were hashing. Uh, in, in fact, we were hashing like one bit because probably zero could be uh, like. Uh, heads for example and one could be tails so we are only hashing two things here and we need to encode we, we need to encode what we are hashing here and probably we will use for example zero for hits and one for tails or whatever you want but there are only two values so yeah the hash function uh, the problem here is then I can uh, is not uh, so high in here is hiding uh, well we are not hiding anything because if you provide me the hash of a heads of a zero I mean if you commit to this hash here then I can simply hash a zero or hash a one and then check if any of the any of this is your commitment okay so in this case we will we would would not uh, hide the result okay so in fact to build uh, an actual commitment scheme we need to add some randomness that we call open okay so the commitment scheme the one of the base I mean the most basic commitment scheme which is based on a is simply based on a hash function is just uh, take your uh, the data that you want to commit to, then some randomness that we call open, and then hash these two values, and then we obtain the commitment. Uh, and then, how do we do the opening? Well, the opening, the opening then is just uh, uh, when you reveal, uh, then the opening is just providing publicly you provide the uh, what well, you, you just provide the two values I mean you provide the thing that you commit to and uh, your data and the open and then yeah everybody can can hash and then check that uh, is that this corresponds to the committed to the committed value okay so it's, it's just redo again the operate the, the the hash the commit uh, but in this case you uh, when when the commitment is open then you get the the you know, uh, you need the op the the randomness and the value that you committed and uh, while while these two are not provided then you cannot know anything Okay, because yeah, the open is a random, is a, is a randomness, and is a big enough randomness. For example, you can imagine two hundred and fifty-six bits. For example. Okay, so yeah, uh, the commitment is a hash that doesn't tell you anything, essentially, until they, 
until the, the, the party that wants to do the open provides me these two values, the data and the open. <clears throat> okay, so this is one of the uses, and uh, as I said, it's very useful uh, to build uh, smart contracts uh, that, for example, uh, can implement uh, blind actions or uh, and many other things. Uh, now let's let's go for another very useful structure built with uh, hash functions, which are Merkle trees, and uh, let me show you an example just to motivate a little bit uh, and uh, well imagine that you have uh, you want to build some system uh, with a list of identifiers okay you have a list of identifiers identifier one identifier two and so on and you want to build a system that distributed this distributes a list of identifiers and these identifiers may for example represent uh, items that have been revoked uh, for example credit cards let's say okay so this is a list of credit cards that are that have been revoked that are in a blacklist okay something something wrong that there was something wrong with these credit cards and they cannot be used and they are in a list in a blacklist okay so uh, how can I uh, how can I distribute this information to users? I mean, there is an issue that there is an entity here that creates this list or receives the uh, receives some uh, requires uh, some requests to revoke, for example, uh, credit cards, and then creates a list and then sends this list to users. Uh, typically, scenario here could be that. Uh, the issuer of this list just d creates a digital signature and uh, sends this list to a server and then users can download the list of uh, revoked identifiers and this list is, is digitally signed by the issuer okay so this is this is one way to build this application uh, let, let's see another way Another way, uh, the, well, the, one of the problems of, of this uh, of this scheme is that this list might might be potentially could be very big. So uh, maybe as a user, I only want to know if a certain identifier is revoked. But uh, to check this in this uh, with this system, then I need to download a the complete list of uh, revoked identifiers okay so how, can we do it differently yes we can do it with uh, what we call responders in this case well the issuer uh, still generates a list of uh, revoked identifiers and sends this list to a mm, intermediate uh, server that in this case we call responder and then users just ask for the uh, identifier they want. I mean, here uh, our user will say, okay, uh, identifier XXX is revoked, is in the list, and then this responder will say yes or no. Okay. Uh, this this uh, other mechanism has the advantage that probably these answers are going to be smaller because you only get a yes or no. Okay. But... Uh, since, uh, I mean, now the user is getting the response from this intermediate uh, server that, that is a trusted party here because, uh, I mean, the responder tells me yes or no, but as a user, I don't trust this, uh, an answer only saying yes or no. I need a proof. Uh, and in this case, it's a digital signature. Okay, these, are, these yes or no are digitally signed by the responder. Well, uh, probably here the uh, amount of uh, resources in the transmission we, we are we, we are uh, uh, decreasing the amount of information that we need to transfer but we introduce a responder that is a trusted party because it, it needs to sign these responses these yes no responses so yeah the motivation to introduce the the Merkle trees is could, I mean, 
from the res from this scenario, from the scenario with the responder, I like that the answer saying if something is revoked or not is is small, okay. Uh, and on the other side, I like this scenario because this entity here is not. No, it's not trusted. I mean, it's just a server. It's a repository where you leave data, but the repository doesn't need to sign anything. It is it's, it is not a trusted party. Okay, so I would like an, an, a scenario with both, with uh, the best of both worlds. I mean, I would like something with a repository, <coughs> but the answer should be small. Okay, so this is the, the idea. <coughs> And one answer to fix this, I mean, one one uh, one way of achieving this, uh, the, is to use a Merkle tree. Okay, a Merkle tree is just uh, it's just a construction built with hash functions, uh, and uh, the idea is to build a structure, uh, to build a, a structure uh, with hashes. Let's see. Uh, in in this case, uh, we're going to build a hash tree. This is a hash tree. Uh, the hash tree, as the name says, is it, it, it's a tree. And um, in this case, this hash tree has four leaves. Each leaf will, in this case, has we have four data for different data, pieces of data that are included in this Merkle tree. <coughs> and uh, yeah, the idea is uh, this data, for example, the, that this data zero could be the serial number or the identifier of a revoked uh, credit card, for example, or, or whatever we want, okay? And uh, then, so I have four different data and then I hash each of these data. I hash each piece of data and then to get finally my uh, my values of, of the leaves. Okay, so the, the H00 is the first, the first leaf and is the hash of the piece of data that is contained in this first leaf. H01 then is the second leaf and it's just uh, the this leaf is just obtained by hashing the second piece of data that are, I'm including in the Merkel, Merkel tree and so on and so forth in the uh, leaf level okay so I hash I have uh, some four data four pieces of data in this in this example I just hash each piece of data and obtain the leaves of my Merkle tree. Okay, and then I need to combine leaves to, op to obtain uh, an, an intermediate an intermediate node. And in this particular case, uh, this is a binary Merkle tree because we are combining leaves or in general nodes in pairs. So in this case, I take the hash of this leaf I, I take the hash of this leaf I call, I, and then I hash the concatenation to obtain uh, one intermediate node. And I do the same here to obtain H1. And finally, I concatenate these two to finally obtain the root of the Merkle tree. So, yeah, Merkle tree is just a tree structure that we built from the pieces of data that are, that are contained on, on the on the Merkle tree and uh, in this particular case and in, in general is very used uh, this one is a binary Merkle tree because we are combining nodes in pairs uh, so if we have a, if, if we want to store n leaves in our Merkle tree then we will need I mean, it, at, uh, then we will need the logarithm in base 2 of n levels. 
because at, at each level, I mean, if, if the Merkle tree is binary, at each level, we essentially are halving the number of nodes. Okay, so, and then how, how do we use this, this structure? Um, well, which is the advantage of this, of this structure? Well, now the idea is that you may ask, okay, uh, data zero, okay? The piece of data D zero is contained in the Merkle tree. And I can tell you, yes, I can say yes. And, uh, and, to, to, and I can give you a proof of this, okay? And the proof is going to be small and uh, and the proof can be provided by a repository which doesn't need to be trusted and the idea is that uh, we we will have or we will provide uh, the uh, the merkel the root of the tree finally at the at the top level of the tree there is only one node and uh, then what we do is that uh, we sign this uh, root and then when you ask me, okay, uh, I don't know, that data zero is in the Merkle tree. And then I say yes, in this case, okay, I say yes. And, uh, and then I provide you a proof that this data zero is in the tree. And how you, ch and which is the proof? The proof are the sibling nodes, okay? Is this node here? Is this, no this node here? These two, this, this two nodes here. Okay, are the siblings of the data that you're asking for. So if you ask, okay, D0 is in the Merkle tree, I would say yes. And then I will provide you uh, H01. Okay, so you're asking for D0. So you know D0. So you can hash D0 if, and obtain H00. This is someone, the, the entity that is asking if D0, D0 is in the Merkle tree can compute H00. And then I provide H01. And then uh, you can hash this too and compute H0 in this case. And then I provide H1. The, the Merkle tree proof provides me H1. And then I can hash these two and compute the root. And then essentially what we what we do here to be sure that the that the D0 is in the tree is just uh, computing the root from the siblings and checking that uh, the value that I compute is the same as the root with the which is digitally signed. Uh, that, that I, I mean is the same that the root that I'm provided with a digital signature. Okay, so applying uh, applying this uh, to our scenario, the idea is that in this case the issuer creates a list creates a list of uh, revoked identifiers, and, and then from this list creates a Merkle tree and signs the root and then sends this information to the repository. And now users can ask for certain identifiers saying, okay, is this identifier in the tree? And then the repository can answer to this question just providing siblings, siblings of the asked uh, value. I mean, all the path, this is called the Merkle proof or Merkle path. And as I said, the repository provides the Merkle proof or the Merkle path together with the signed, digitally signed root. And then the user can check that uh, the root computed from the provided values is the same after, as the digital uh, as the digitally signed root. Um, and in, if they match, it means that uh, it means that the, that the data for which you are asking to is in is in the Merkle tree. Uh, 
Um, and you cannot change. Obviously, if you change anything here, if you just change one single piece of data in any leaf, then essentially what happens is that the root will change and then uh, and then you will not have, I mean, you, have, you will have another root and, and not uh, the, the, I mean, the issuer just signs the correct root. So you, if you try to change any, any value here in any leaf or in any intermediate node, essentially the root will not match. So this is a way, this structure allows us to check if some data is included in this in the structure in the Merkle tree or not. And the Merkle proof allows me to prove without any doubt that uh, data is or is not in the tree. Uh, so, well, you have, we have some, some numbers, but you will do the, some practice. And uh, well, let, let's, for example, apply this uh, this idea to our our original scenario, in uh, in which uh, we have in which we wanted to build a uh, list of identifiers. Okay, in this case, identifier three. 13, 37, 9, and 45, for example, okay? This is, I want to build a Merkle tree that contains these four identifiers. And, and then uh, the idea is that I use this structure to answer. Uh, people then will ask me, okay, uh, 37 is in the tree. And in this case, being in the tree might, for example, mean that, uh, uh, that the, this identifier is is in a blacklist or is revoked. Okay, so in this case, well, if I ask for 37, okay, then uh, the repository just need to provide me the siblings. It will need to provide me H00, H, H1, and then yeah, from 37, I hash 37 and I obtain this one. Then I hash it with this, concatenate these two values and compute H0. Then the repository provide me H1. Then I concatenate H0 and H1 and I obtain the root. And then the repository also provides me the, the digital, digitally signed root. And I check that these two are the same. If these two are the same, there is no doubt that uh, 37 is in the tree. But uh, okay, this is okay, but we still need a, we still have a small problem uh, that is okay, I, uh, but how do I answer that something is not in the tree? So if you ask me for 35, how do I tell you that 35 is not in the tree? I mean, how do, you, how do I answer you and prove you that 35 is not in the tree? And, uh, well, we can do a slight modification for this. Um, in this case, for example, the data, the, the data that we are uh, storing in the tree could be, uh, could be, could have two parts. And, and we can also sort the, uh, this information in the leaves. So, for example, if, again, if I want to say that nine is, is in the blacklist, 13 is in the blacklist, 37 is in the blacklist, and 49 is in, in uh, 45 is in the blacklist, okay? But the rest of the identifiers are whitelisted. I mean, they are not in the blacklist. So how can I code and code this? Well, we can encode this, for example, uh, with just providing the range, saying for, for, for 0, 9, it would mean that uh, from 0 to 8, they are in the whitelist, they're white, so and nine is revoked. Okay, so the last one could be the, the the one revoked. Okay, for example, this piece of data here means that 10, 11, and 12 they are in the white. They're white, and 13 it is. This is this one is revoked. Okay, and so on, and then I sort all this information and then create a Merkle tree. And then when you ask me, okay, uh, 30, 35 is revoked, and I will say no. And then I provide you this information, okay? I provide you 14 and 37, okay? I say, okay, 
35 is not revoked because I have a range here that goes from the from 14 to 37. And now with this, you know that 37 is in the blacklist, but uh, but from 14 to 36 they are not. In the, they are whitelisted, in fact. So uh, the repos the repository will provide me these two values. I hash them. Okay, I hash them and obtain h10 and then the repository will provide me uh, will provide me h11 so i can compute h1 then the repository provides me h0 so i can compute the root and then the, the repository also provides me the root digitally signed and i check that uh, this too much and then i am effectively uh, checking that 35 is not revoked okay so this is one application uh, we will see an application of uh, the hash trees. Uh, we are going to see uh, now, I mean, what I've dis discussed right now, uh, until now, uh, commitments and Merkle trees are rather generic uh, constructions built with hash and they have apl applications on blockchain and we will see, when we will see them in, in, in just a, a moment. And now, well, let, let's start seeing different applications of, of hash uh, uh, functions in blockchain. So first, well, in blockchain, uh, a blockchain is just a sequence of blocks, okay? And, and these blocks are half an order. I mean, they, they are an ordered, uh, they are an ordered list of blocks. And how we, how do we enforce this order? Well, we enforce it because at each block we include the hash of the previous block. Okay, so this is like including a cryptographic summary of the previous block. So in blockchain, we link blocks using hash functions. Okay, uh, because each block contains the hash of the previous block. Well, except one very special block that is the first block, which is also called the Genesis block. And in this case, well, the hash of the previous block is null because there, there is no previous block. So this is one of the uses uh, of uh, hash functions in blockchain, chaining blocks. The other one is for the algorithm of uh, building the consensus algorithm. And uh, well, mm, here, uh, miners, they need to find a number for the block that matches, I mean, they, they need to find a number, which is called a nonce. And uh, mm, miners need to find an, uh, this number that, that must fulfill some uh, properties. Okay, and uh, the idea is that this number, this nonce, is difficult to find, and each nonce, I mean, for each block, for each each block has some potential nonces that are correct. Okay, but each block has a different set of nonces that are correct. Okay, and the idea is that the only way to find these nonce is trying trying numbers. You try numbers and, until there is some number that is correct for the block okay and every it, it, when when we are doing the proof of work uh, uh, all the nodes on the, on the network they are trying numbers and they are trying to find a nonce that is correct for their block the first miner that finds this number is the one that wins the competition it's like a lottery uh, in some way it is a lottery and the lottery tells which is the next miner that is uh, going to uh, create a block okay and the idea is that uh, uh, the only way to do this is try nonsense try this num try numbers and then you try numbers until until you find one that f is okay for your block and then you are the winner okay if you try more you will have more pro more possibilities to uh, to be the the to be the entity, the, the miner that creates uh, that creates the uh, next block, uh, and well, miners are interested in creating blocks because they receive rewards in exchange. So, well, 
uh, and then how how do how do we how we decide how we decide uh, which are the correct what what is a correct nonce and which is not okay well again is using a hash function and uh, the idea is that uh, you have your block each miner has uh, the proposal the the proposal uh, the proposed block and, and then they start trying uh, to hash the block with some nonce for example a lot of zeros and then check and then they need to check if mm, the nonce all zeros is okay or not. Well, how do we check this? We do a hash function here. Okay, we do a hash of the contents of the block with the nonce, and then we see the output. Uh, if uh, if I ask, for example, if I say, okay, uh, you need to find a nonce, okay, for the nonce to be correct to be the nonce that uh, creates a block, you need to find a nonce such that when you hash your nonce together with your block proposal, you obtain exactly this output in the hash function. Okay? This is exactly 256 bits in the output of the hash function. Uh, our hash function, for uh, the hash function that is used for this process that is called proof of work is uh, the SHA-256 uh, hash function. So, well, if I say, okay, you need to find a nonce such that when you hash your proposal with the nonce, it should output exactly this 256 bits. Well, if I tell you to do this, well, then you should say this is impossible because I mean, uh, because uh, how many tries do I need to... I mean, the hash function outputs a random value. So it's like, okay, you are telling me that uh, I need to put a nonce here, give a try, and, and, and then the output should be exactly 256 bits. Well, remember that this, this is like... Uh, it's, it's a huge number. I mean, it, it, is, it is going to be impossible that I... Trying numbers, it is going to be impossible that I uh, output exactly the 256 bits that you are saying. Okay, so this is extremely difficult. So the idea of proof of work is okay. Well, let's let's do it more easy. Okay, well let's let's say let's say for example that I put it more easy and say, okay, try give me some nonce that. Uh, when you hash it with your block proposal, the output, the first bit of the output is a zero, for example. This is much easier, okay? Just the first bit. So, with one, trying one nonce, which is the probability that the first bit is zero, well, this is 50%, okay? Remember that hash functions behave like assigning random numbers to inputs. So, half with half of the probability this is going to be zero with half of the probability this is going to be one so i just put a nonce here i do the hash i check the first input and with half of the probability is zero okay it's like uh before I, I was saying like okay you should exactly you should exactly guess 256 bits this is impossible computationally impossible this is impossible to compute okay but if i tell you okay I you just need to, uh, I mean, just just need to put some hash, to put some nonce there that when you hash it, the first bit is zero. It's like half of the, I mean, half of the numbers, half of the output will be start with zero and half of the output start with one. So fifty percent, I will, I will uh, get this result. Fifty percent, I will get a one. But if I try again, I mean, with with not so many tries, uh, it is obvious that I'm going to obtain a hash here. Okay. Well, the idea then is how blockchain uses this. Okay, is uh, we adjust the difficulty. Okay. So, for example, if I said, okay, one zero is too easy. Uh, the output of the hash function 
should should have two uh, two zeros for example okay then with trying one nonce with one try then we have 25 percent of the possibilities of getting an output of the hash function that has two zeros okay and uh, so essentially we are building here a, like a lottery okay uh, I want a lottery that is not so complex. I want a lottery that is uh, doable. I mean, you uh, you try numbers until you get one number. I mean, the, all the all the miners of the network will be trying numbers. Each miner will try with uh, its own uh, block proposal, and and they are trying, and and then we want to have a winner. And the idea is that the, this process, the difficulty of this process can be adjusted. And the idea is how to adjust this is by deciding the number of bits to zero that you need to get in the output of the hash function. Okay, so this is like creating a decentralized uh, lottery uh, to select which is the miner that is going to create the block. Essentially, this is this is it. Um, and if I put more zeros, then it is going to be more difficult to find a nonce that uh, fulfills this difficulty. And if I put less zeros, then it's going to be easier. Okay. Well, maybe one question is, okay, and how do I, how do we adjust the difficulty? Uh, well, in in general, this is this is something about the proof of work, okay. Uh, so, well, blockchains adjust the difficulty to um, keep the uh, block sequence, the average of of uh, block sequence, uh, some average. I mean, for example, Bitcoin is ten minutes between blocks, for example. Okay, so well, this is uh, related. Okay, but well, in, in this lesson we would, we just wanted to see how to create a how to create a cryptographic lottery in which you can adjust the difficulty. Okay, and this is this is this is done again with a hash function. Uh, yeah, mm. and. Uh, yeah, to finish to finish this this lesson, uh, let's let's talk about this uh, uh, about this mechanism here, which is called the simplified pay payment verification, and uh, essentially essentially in in a this is the case of the Bitcoin network, by the way. In the case of the Bitcoin network, uh, in fact, what we what, what we distribute, I mean, what we send through the network, I mean, blocks, in fact, are separated in a header and in the list of transactions. But, uh, you know, if you want to check, for example, if a, trans if a transaction has happened, uh, in general, if if we don't split this, and uh, we just have, I mean, uh, well, by the way, in, in the in the Bitcoin network, what we have is a list of transactions, but in the header, what we have is the root, the Merkle root, is, is the root of a Merkle tree. Okay, we have we take the list of transactions, create a Merkle tree with them. And then put the root on the header, okay, and distribute the header. The idea here is that if you want to check if a transaction is has been included in the blockchain, then you need you don't need to to do the check with all the block and all the transactions. But you just need the headers, okay. So essentially, you you just need the headers because the headers well the headers have the nonce. The number that uh, that hashed hash it together with the header provides the correct difficulty, and then we have the hash of the previous block. So as you see, 
everything is related with hashes. Here we have the hash of the previous block. And, and then here we have the Merkel root with us, which, which is a hash, in fact, of, of all uh, that is the root of a Merkel tree with all the transactions of the block. So the idea here is that if you are a if you want if you want a simplified payment verification means that I want to check that uh, a transaction has happened, okay? But I want to do it in a simplified way. It means I don't want to. I mean, one one possibility of saying okay, this transaction. I mean, this transaction is in the blockchain. How how do you prove this to me? Uh, if I don't split the blocks into into headers. And, and transactions, then I will need all the blocks to check if the trans this transaction is, is here. Okay, I will, I will need all the blocks and, and all the linking of these blocks. I, I will need to check, I will need to check uh, from the Genesis block, I will need to check all the blocks and all the blocks, including all the transactions. Okay, um, by using this trick of separating the header and then in the header just put them. Is it the Merkle root? You can see it as a summary of the transactions of the block, okay? But okay, to check that I that transaction this transaction has happened in this block, I only need the headers of the surrounding blocks, and then a Merkle proof that this transaction is included in this root, okay? But I, I don't need the rest of the transactions of this of these blocks, okay? I, I don't need these transactions. And I don't even need the the other transactions of the block. I just need a proof, a Merkel proof that proves me that my tra the transaction in the, that I am interested in is included in this Merkel root, is part of this Merkel root, and then just need to check the headers uh, to check that the blockchain is okay, okay, With, that the headers of these blocks are okay, and uh, I am considering the. Uh, the correct uh, sequence of blocks, okay? But the idea is that uh, I don't need the rest of the transactions. So, well, this is uh, also another use of hash functions in uh, blockchain systems. Um, and with uh, this, we come to the end of this lessons, lesson in which we have uh, seen different, uh, different uses of blockchain, uh, different uses of hash functions, sorry. Uh, we have seen commitments and we have applied these to tossing coins, but as I said, we are going to apply this also to smart contracts in uh, some of the practices. Uh, we also saw uh, the Merkle tree structure and we saw that uh, we can give a proof that something is in the Merkle tree, just the siblings until we uh, go to the root and then the root sign and then I can check that uh, something is inside the, the Merkle tree. And uh, finally, we also discuss some uh, use cases of the hash function in, uh, in the blockchain, in a blockchain system. Uh, in particular, we discuss how, how to build a, a lottery, a, a cryptographic lottery that, uh, in which I can adapt the difficulty uh, we build this with a hash function and uh, also we saw uh, how to how Bitcoin for example uses Merkle roots uh, just to not include in the blocks uh, all the transactions I mean the what uh, nodes can uh, I mean when you want to check that a transaction has happened you just need the headers of the blocks and then a Merkle proof uh, that your transaction is included in, in some of the uh, some of the past blocks. And uh, okay, that concludes the lesson.